Okay, so this this uh, part of the, the workshop is a little different in that this is a section that only has a lecture. There's no associated practical. Um, and as Michelle said, this is on de novo genome assembly. So I was glad to hear that some people at least uh, are not working primarily on human and they have, they've sequenced something else and, and they'll want to use gen genome assembly as a starting point. And um, in the next hour or so, I'm going to go over genome assembly from both a theoretical standpoint of how the assemblers are actually working, what are they internally doing when they take a sequenced genome and try to reconstruct it, and also the practical aspects of genome assembly and how you can get uh, hopefully good results out of, of genome assembly software that you, you, you use. Um, so I'm Jared Simpson. I'm a principal investigator at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. I've been working in genome assembly for about seven or eight years now. Um, at last count, I, I've written four different assembly software packages. Uh, you can interpret that in two ways. Either assembly is very hard and the, the field's always changing, or that I'm just never, not very good at it and I need to constantly rewrite new software. Uh, it's the former. Thank you, Francis. I appreciate that. Um, right, so just to get started... Um, what is genome assembly? So we're all on, all on the same page here. So I'm going to refer to um, pictures of genomes that look like this. So I'm going to refer to these cartoonish looking uh, pictures of genomes uh, to illustrate some points throughout the talk. Now, um, genomes are made up of, of both a unique sequence, which I'm visualizing by these colored bars, and repetitive sequence, which I'm visualizing by these red bars here. The repeats are what makes genome assembly difficult. Um, if you have sequence that's present in multiple different places uh, in the genome, it, the assembler has to try to put those repeats in the right place. And when the read length is a lot shorter than the lengths of the repeats, which is commonly the case when we use Illumina sequencing, that's very difficult. And that's why genome assembly is so hard, and, and, and we're constantly trying to come up with new ways of, of resolving these repetitive structures. So uh, going back to the question of what genome assembly is, we start with a genome that looks like this, and then we sequence it, which can be thought of as just taking random pieces of the genome, figuring out their sequence from end to end. Um, so usually the, the, this, the length of the reads is much, much shorter than the genome. So even if you sequence a bacterial genome, which might only be, say, five megabases in length, you sequence it with, a, with roughly 100 base pair reads, which is six orders of magnitude shorter. And then the genome assembler has to take all those reads and then reconstruct the genome into its original, uh, into its, its original structure. So we, we take a genome, we sequence it by breaking it into pieces, and then the genome assembler is essentially inverting that process by taking the small pieces and trying to put them back together. Uh, so here's an overview of what I'll talk about. First is really a theoretical section where I'll talk about assembly graphs and the data structures that assemblers are using. That's just to get you familiar with common terminology. Um, and then I'll walk through an example assembly pipeline from taking a sequenced genome in FASTQ format and going through uh, the full assembly process. Um, and then, then I'll talk about some of the features that make assembly difficult. Unfortunately, assembly is a, is a process that's uh, ripe for failure. If your genome is, say, extremely heterozygous, extremely repetitive, it, you can get very poor results. And I'll try to talk about some of the features that lead to difficulty during assembly so you can understand them when you, when you sequence uh, a genome you're interested in. And then I'll talk a little bit about the future and how assembly is changing with the introduction of long reads, where the read lengths can be 10 kilobases or longer. For example, the Pacific Biosciences sequencer or the Oxford Nanopore Institute. Okay, so I'm also going to look at this structure a lot during the talk. So this is an assembly graph. Now, when I mentioned what the structure of genomes look like, how they're made up of repetitive segments, the way that assemblers deal with the repeat content within genomes is it makes a graph of where each vertex is a sequence, for example, a sequence read, and it links uh, two vertices by an edge if those sequences are related in some way. So example, if two reads overlap, you put an edge in the graph. And this is the way uh, that the assembly deals with complexity of the genome. It's a very concise representation of the sequencing data, 
and we can perform inference over this graph to try to figure out what the original structure of the genome was by looking at certain features within this graph. And I'm going to come back to this a few different uh, times during this talk. So now, when you work with a genome assembler, you'll, uh, it'll, take, it'll use one of two types of assembly graph. Um, if you're working with next generation sequencing data like Illumina data, the assembler will use a data structure called a de Brown graph. This is an extremely popular uh, model of genome assembly because it's a very efficient way to represent the sequencing data and, it's, and it can be built extremely quickly. Uh, the older way of assembling genomes was using overlap-based methods, or what's now called string graphs, which are representing overlaps between reads, um, which is much slower and much heavier to work with. I'm going to give examples of both of these two types of graphs over the next couple of slides. So I'm going to start with, with the string graph or the overlap graph, because it's conceptually the simplest representation of the data. So here we're just looking for overlaps between reads, and by overlap I mean where at the end of one read matches the start of another read, for example, uh, here. And when we have two reads that overlap, we just put an edge between them. So here we've got two reads, read one, which starts A, C, G, and so on, and we're representing that as a vertex in the graph. We have a second read, read two, which is A, T, G. We represent that as a second vertex in the graph. And because the, the start of read two matches uh, the, the end of read one, we've linked them by an edge in our assembly graph. Okay? Now, as we add more and more uh, reads to our collection, so we've added a third read here, we have a third edge, its prefix matches the end of the other two reads, so it has edges to both of them, and so on, we start to build up a picture of what the genome might look like. And now the fundamental bit of theory about genome assembly is, uh, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Yeah. On the bottom. That's right, yeah. So, so the next slide is that, um, when we go to assemble the genome, all we're doing is trying to find a path through this graph and concatenating the, the, the strings that are on the edges, these edge labels. So this, this fundamental piece of theory is that the, uh, the, the genome is a path through this graph of all of the reads. And that's really the, the only thing you need to understand about how, how the assembler is building these graphs is that it, it builds this graph and then it's trying to just find some path through the graph that reconstructs the sequence of the genome. Um, now, of course, there's been plenty of caveats in dealing with things like heterozygosity, dealing with these repeats that I've been referring to, and dealing with sequencing errors. But really, we're just trying to construct a graph representing our data, find a walk through. So is that part, is, that, is there any more questions at this point? I like to usually like to say that like this, I'm up here talking, but this is a workshop, so please just jump in with questions as, as we, we go along if anything's uh, not clear. So if a subsequent fragment aligns perfectly, then you don't add any word That's right, yeah. So um, we would call those contained reads, where the read is contained within some other read. And uh, it doesn't add any additional information about what the structure of the genome is, so those are removed up front. Okay, so here's what uh, a generic assembly pipeline looks like. So at the start of the pipeline, we have FASTQ data, which is fresh off your sequencing instrument. And then we might perform read trimming and read filling to clean up the data, remove artifacts from the data set. We then might perform error correction, build the assembly graph, which I've just been talking about, clean it of more artifacts, construct contigs, scaffold the contigs together, and finally fill gaps. And that would be the, the result. That would be the, the assembler's view of what your genome looks like. And I'm going to talk about all of these steps in detail. And this is more moving into the practical aspects of the things that you need to do when you're assembling a genome. Um, so sequencing adapters, I think, came up a few different times. But how this, the Illumina sequencers work is that they take uh, synthetic sequences, ligate it to the ends of your biological DNA, and then that's used to prime the sequencing process. Now, usually the Illumina software will strip those adapters off, and what you get in your FASTQ files is just biological sequence. Now, if for some reason 
this process uh, went wrong and the synthetic adapters remained in your reeds, they can completely ruin your assembly. To the po point of view of the assembler, they're going to look like a repeat that was an extremely high copy number and it won't be able to construct long contigs. So um, often, if you have adapter contamination in your, in your data, you have to remove those adapters before giving them to the genome assembly uh, software. Some assemblers come uh, packaged with, a, with trimmers. They will hunt for these adapters and remove them. Um, otherwise, you might want to use uh, a standalone trimmer. I quite like this Trimomatic software. Uh, that can take a library of Illumina adapters, hunt for them at the ends of your sequences, and then get rid of them so they don't, they don't ruin your assembly. Um, another way that you might want to trim is by quality score. So we, t we, we heard about quality scores uh, this morning where the, the Illumina sequencer has this characteristic error rate where uh, the quality of the data drops towards the three prime end of the read. If you have particularly bad data, you might want to just uh, remove the bad bases at the end of the read to uh, reduce the work that the assembler is going to have to do to resolve the, that low quality uh, sequence. And again, all of these, these softwares will, be, will perf perform both adapter and quality trimming. If you have really bad data. Yes, if you, if you have exceptionally poor data, then just resequence it. Uh, complain to your sequencing core. Uh, they love to hear that your, their data is not good enough to use. Um, but yeah, you, sometimes, it, at, at some point, you want to, to weigh how much time you have to put into working with your data against just running you know, a, a new high-seek lane, which is really quite cheap these days. Um, so just to go, to go back to that point I just raised, uh, the error rate at the ends of reads uh, increases. I think Matei talked about this earlier this morning. Um, and might have even shown this same plot. So this is six different sequence genomes. Um, it's a yeast, a uh, cerevisiae, a fish, a Lake Malawi cichlid, a snake, a human genome, uh, a parakeet, and an oyster genome. And these six different sequencing runs have extremely different error rates. Um, the human data, which is this light blue line here, is quite good. The error rate is less than uh, half a percent across the entire length of the read, but say for the, the, the fish data set or the bird data, the error rate is much higher uh, towards the end. So this is data that you might want to perform quality trimming on or run an error corrector on. So how error correction works uh, is that it looks for sequences that are uh, very rare within the data set, and then it tries to fix those rare sequences to be more common sequences. So it's looking for sequencing errors within your data and trying to uh, recover what the real sequence was after removing the errors. So to illustrate this process, um, we're, we're going to consider this read here, which has a single error, which is the, colored in this red C here. And a lot of the error, uh, error correctors are based on Kamer counting. So Kamer counting is where we take a fixed length string of length k, in this case k is just 20, so we're looking at 20 base segments of the genome, and then we just count how many times they occur across our entire run of sequencing data. And this is a very efficient thing to do, and for sequences that don't contain errors, we expect to see them quite often. So if we've sequenced to 40x coverage, we'd see these 20 MERS about 40 times. However, if, if there's a sequencing error, because the sequencing errors are roughly random and roughly uniform, we expect to see the, the substrings that have an error within them very few times. So the substring that has this red C, which is our sequencing error here, is only seen once across the entire data set. So, so, how, do you, how do you know ahead of time that you actually have an uh, How do we know if we, if we have an error? So this is, it, we, we do this exact process. Uh, okay. We just start from the beginning of the read, count how many times the first 20 mer is there, how many times the second 20 mer, all the way across, along. And when we see the, uh, the, the 20 mer that's very rare, that's when we'd say, okay, we've detected an error. What are the possible alternatives? Let's just, uh, let's change this C to one of the three other bases, and one of them would flip that to be, to be the true sequence. Uh, 
So just looking at that a little different way, this is uh, a graph of the, the number of times the 20 mer has been seen as a function of the position in the read. And you see we, we start from the, the first 20 mer, it's around, uh, can't read that, around 27. And then we're just going up and down between 20 and 30. And then when we get to this point here, the, K, the, the 20 mer frequency drops to 1. So we detect an error at this point, and then we look for uh, a, a correction that can make all those 20 mers well represented in the data. Um, so you can either use a, a standalone KMER based error correctors. I've listed a bunch here. Quake is very popular, SGA, Soap de Novo, uh, BFC, Blast, Lighter Musket. And these are all fairly good uh, algorithms that run very quickly on your data. Um, and by performing this error correction process, you, you're giving much cleaner data to the assembler and you're reducing the amount of work that the assembler has to do to, to resolve these sort, of, uh, these sort of artifacts. Now there's also uh, error correctors that are based on finding inexact overlaps between reads, so aligning reads to each other and looking for differences. Um, and these tend to work quite well if the error rate's very high, but they're extremely slow. Rather than uh, just counting 20 MERS, uh, you're, you're performing inexact overlaps between a vast number of pairs of reads, and that's computationally very inefficient. So we typically don't run overlap-based error correctors on, on very high throughput data sets. Okay, so now we've performed a little bit of data quality control and data cleanup through read trimming and, and read error correction. Now we're starting to get into the meat of the assembly, which is uh, constructing the assembly graph and finding the, assembling it into our genome. So I, I talked about overlap graphs before. Uh, now I'm going to talk about DeBrown graphs. So DeBrown graphs are based on this idea of KMERS, which I, was, I just introduced during error correction. Um, Essentially what a DeBrown graph is, is we take all, all strings of length k, this is an example where k is 4, and we make a vertex for every former that's in our data set, and we connect two formers with an edge if they overlap by k minus 1, or in this case, 3 uh, bases. Okay, so this is our, our example data set here. We have uh, five different reads. The first one, C, C, G, T, T, A. So it has formers C, C, G, T, that's this vertex here, C, G, T, T, this vertex here, G, T, T, A, here. Okay, and then if we do that for all of the reads, we get this graph. And now we see this graph branches because this C, G, T, T, which I've labeled in red here, is present in two copies within our reads with different uh, sequences that are after it. So we can either... Uh, we have GTTA following, CGTT, and GTTT, uh, GTTC following it here. Now what the assembler is going to try to do is resolve that repeat, and we can see that there's one path through the graph that can visit every single vertex here. So we can go down here, follow this chain of vertices, back through here to the second copy of this CGTT, and then up through here. And again, this is just this principle that we're trying to find walks that reconstruct the sequence of our genome. Um, now this is just a diversion into uh, the efficiency of genome assemblers. When I started working uh, in, a, uh, in, in genome assembly in 2008, uh, we weren't so concerned about making the assembly software very fast or very memory efficient. We just wanted to be able to take Illumina data, these very short reads, and then get some meaningful result out of it. So the first genome assemblers were incredibly inefficient. Um, they would construct these KMER based graphs and it would require about 100 bits per KMER. And if you translate that to trying to assemble a human genome which might have 10 billion KMERs in the graph, the amount of memory would be about a terabyte. Now, almost never you'll have access to, to a computer that has that much memory. So a lot of the work that's gone into uh, de novo assembly in the last 10 years is just trying to reduce the amount of memory required to perform assembly of large genomes. And because of all that work that's gone into it, we can now assemble a human genome using a brown graph using about 10 gigabytes of memory rather than a, a, about 1,000 gigabytes or a terabyte of memory, which was what the situation was about seven years ago. Um, 
So after the assembler has constructed uh, the graph, it wants to perform additional graph cleaning steps to try to get rid of artifacts. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about two different types of artifacts that appear. The first one is what we refer to as tips. So these are structures in the assembly graph that branch and then just don't go anywhere. They branch, have a few connected vertices, and then they stop. They have only a connection on one end and not the other. Now, these structures are caused by residual sequencing errors that the error corrector or the error trimming wasn't able to get rid of. So if we have a sequencing error at the end of our read that was uncorrected, all of these k-mers at the end of the read aren't going to be connected to anything because they're rare, so they're unlikely to have uh, be seen in multiple reads, so they cause just this structure here that goes nowhere. Likewise, this sequencing error would cause this structure here that goes nowhere. Now the assembler wants to take walks through the graph, and we want those walks to be very long. That means we're reconstructing large segments of the genome uh, in, into single pieces. So you want your genome to represent your genes in single copy or in single contigs, so that you can then run um, a gene finding program and, and, and see what your, your genome's coding. And to do that, you need to be able to make very long walks along the graph. But because of these artifacts that branch off, they confuse the assembler. So the assembler wants to identify these residual sequencing errors and then remove them from the graph to only leave this gray path uh, through the bottom here. Now there's a second type of artifact that the assembler has to deal with, which is uh, what we call bubbles. So these are caused by heterozygosity. So if you sequence a diploid genome, like a human genome, there will be heterozygous SNPs within the genome. And... Um, because of the, the allelic differences, for example, uh, there's a C on, on one haplotype and a G on the other, they cause the graph to branch just like those tips did here. But, um, yes, so if you, if, the, if you have nearby SNPs and they're on the same haplotype, Let's say there was another SNP here, it would just extend the length of these bubbles out. So you'd have a longer structure here, and you can phase them saying that both of these SNPs came from one haplotype, or both of these alleles are one haplotype versus the other. Um, but in general, you, you get isolated structures here. Human genomes only have hets about one in a thousand bases, so you, you end up with these bubbles about every uh, 1,000 vertices in the graph, and as I said before, the assembler wants to be able to just reconstruct long paths through the graph, so it, it'll remove these structures to just represent one haplotype in the graph. So is that clear? Is there any questions at this point? Yeah, so this is where, um, so if I can paraphrase, it's, it, 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 you're asking um, how can we standardize what, what's, what software to use at each step of the pipeline, right? Like how do we choose what trimmer to use, how do we choose what error corrector, and how, when, when you should use one software versus another. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so um, a lot of this comes down to your data set. Unfortunately, um, there's certain error correctors that are very good at, say, getting rid of all of the errors in the data. So if you have, or, or say, very aggressively getting rid of the errors in, in your data. So if you have a high error rate in your data, you might want to use a more aggressive error corrector. Um, on the other hand, if your genome's highly repetitive, uh, you don't want the error corrector to, re to correct copies of repeats to, to, to a different sequence, which would be an error, so you, then you want to be more conservative. So um, it, it, it depends a lot on, on what the, what the, the, the repeat content and, and the properties of your data are. And I'm going to come back to this in, in a little bit. Um, 
what I suggest for anybody who's, who, uh, who's just starting assembly, you, you've sequenced a genome, okay, now I want to assemble it, is to use a fully featured assembly pipeline like All Paths LG, which is written by the Broad Institute, which will integrate all of these steps together. Um, also, I, I recommend going to papers, people who, who run in a full assembly pipeline, see what programs they are using for each step, and then try to walk their way, your way through it. Um, okay, so those are two, two types of artifacts. So after we've sequenced our genome, we, we perform some QC on the data, we might construct an assembly graph that looks like this. Uh, now the assembler wants to assemble this. Unfortunately, the graph is quite complicated. There's branches, every few vertices, and there's not, not a lot the assembler can do. So the first thing it'll do is it'll perform this trip, uh, tip removal step where it identifies these branches in the graphs that just go nowhere. It removes them. Now we have a much cleaner graph. Then we'll look for these bubbles in the graph which uh, indicate heterozygosity. We'll collapse them down to a single allele. And now we have a much cleaner structure and something the assembler can uh, deal with. So the, the step you have a choice? Yeah, you do. Um, usually the assembler will take the path that's higher coverage between the two. Higher so, coverage? Yeah, higher coverage. So higher camer count or the higher number of reads on branch. And the reason for that is rarely you can get sequencing errors um, if, if you get a systematic sequencing error that's seen in multiple reads, it can construct these structures as well. So the heuristic of taking the one with the higher coverage is you're biasing this towards selecting the, um, the true allele rather than the other. Um, if it's a heterozygous SNP, it's essentially arbitrary which one you, you represent in your data, um, so it just picks the higher coverage. Now, a lot of assemblers will, will write out a FASTA file saying that it's removed this structure and it thinks that it's a heterozygous SNP. So then you can go back to that, that file and, and see where the allelic variation in your graph was. Okay, so now we have a much cleaner representation of the data and the assembler can start to build contigs. And the contig building process is just merging all of these simple chains of vertices they can be unambiguously connected together. So there's no branches here, so it'll just merge these together. So the assembler merged the first four vertices, but since this node branched, it could either go here or here, the assembler had to stop. It couldn't merge that node for any further without making uh, the chance at a misassembly because there's two different possibilities from that one. But then it would skip over that, carry on, merge this together, merge this together, and so on, until it finishes with this graph, which is what we call uh, a contig graph uh, or a unitig graph, where we've made all the unambiguous merges together um, to construct these contigs. Now, at this point, you might ask, how long are these contigs going to be? And, and again, it depends on your data. If you sequenced a simple bacterial genome like E. coli with Illumina data, your contigs might be 100,000 kilobases in length. On average, if you sequence something that's uh, more complex, like a human genome, the contigs might only be 10 to 20,000 bases in length. And at this point, um, we want to try to bring in paired in information, which we heard about uh, this morning and, and when Mark was talking about structural variation, as a way of linking these contigs together and jumping over these repetitive branching segments uh, that, that can't be resolved by the reads alone. So the, bac the bacterial-wise usage uh, is larger because it has less variation? Uh, typically because it has less repeats. Less so, so larger genomes tend to be more repetitive um, and they cause more of these branches in the graph that the assembler can't resolve. Okay. Uh, but also, and I'm, I'm going to come back to the variation as well, mm -hmm. but because bacterial genomes don't have variation, um, usually they're clonally grown, and then you sequence a single clone. It makes the assembler, uh, it makes assembly a lot easier as well. So this process of taking um, your contigs and, and paired end data and trying to uh, jump over repeats is called scaffolding. And I'll give an example of that now. Um, so we start by mapping 
read pairs to the contigs. And here I've just depicted a handful of pairs linked with this uh, arc here linking two pairs. So this is one read, this is a second read, and they're a pair linked together. And from this, we'll um, look at pairs that align to the end of one contig and the end of another contig. So these, uh, I'll use the red one, it's a little more visible. So we have red pairs linked here and red pairs linked here. So you simply might think that this, this contig is linked to this one because there's this consistent pattern of pairs that are in a group here. Um, likewise, this, this purple one might be linked here, green, green, blue, blue. Yep. I'm not sure if I understand it. So here you're relying on the same data, but in terms of pairs? With pairs, yeah. A lot of the time... The same data that you used to create the assembly, and you're That's right, yeah. A lot of times the assembler won't look at the pairing information when it's trying to build contigs, just because it... it um, makes the, the problem a lot more complicated and trying to uh, track which pair is linked to which pair takes up a lot of memory. So if you're doing large assembly, which uh, as I mentioned is very hard, just keeping track of all that information is usually too much. So it uses this heuristic of trying to construct contigs first and then bring in the pairing information afterwards. Um, so this can either be your original paired end data or sometimes they'll get longer range mate pair libraries. This may be where the pairs are separated by 5 KB to, to try to jump over even very large repeats. So you can, you, you can think about using uh, multiple different paired end libraries as a way of, of building longer and longer scaffolds. Uh, so once we've mapped all of these reads to our, to our contigs, the assembler will look at consistent pairs um, that are mapped to one end of contig and, and, and the other end of the pair mapped to another, and we'll build what we call a scaffold graph. So this is similar to these, these assembly graphs I was talking about where we have uh, sequences and link edges between them or links between them. Um, and here we're just, the, the sequences are, are contigs and then edges are where the uh, paired end links are mapped to, to either end of the contig. Now, the assembler will try to estimate the distances between the contigs using this known fragment size distribution. So I think this was talked about in this, mor this morning where um, when, you, when you make a paired end library, you expect the pairs to be roughly 400 bases away from each other. So the, the assembler can use that information to say, okay, I've got this contig on one half of the scaffold, this contig on the other half, and I think there's 200 bases in between them. So that's gap size estimation. And uh, that's, that's one of the steps the assembler will use to try to put together contigs. Um, so once it's made these gaps, which with their estimated sizes, we can then try to perform a second round of localized assembly to try to fill in those gaps with real sequences. When the assembler makes scaffolds, it will just put ends in between them, saying that's unknown nucleotides. So in between this contig and this contig, there'd be about 200 ends here. But we can try to perform a second round of assembly to fill in that uh, gap using more localized information. And there's standalone tools for this. There's one called SGA Gap Fill or Gap Closer from Soap De Novo. And you can also use uh, other sequencing technology, for example, PacBio, which is much longer range information, to try to figure out what the sequence is within these gaps. Uh, so if you have PacBio reads, which are 10 KB, even if it's a very repetitive sequence within that gap, the 10 KB read should span that, and we can try to fill that in. Yeah. Yep. Um, yes, there is. So the, the Soap De Novo gap closer tends to be extremely aggressive. It will try to fill in gaps even at the cost of uh, making errors. Um, the SGA gap filler, full disclosure, I wrote that. It's very conservative. It won't fill as many gaps in, but it tries to avoid making errors when it fills in gaps. Uh, there's a nice paper reviewing scaffolding and gap filling um, programs by a guy called Martin Hunt. It was in genome biology, I think, about a year ago. So that's a good resource um, for looking at that. If I have my email address somewhere in the slide. If you email me, I can send you that paper.
Okay, now um, something I've alluded to a few different times is that the results for assembly can, can vary widely across using both different software on the same data or sequencing two different genomes and running it through the same software. Um, so around the time that this paper was published called the Assemblathon 2, I started to explore the question of, of what makes a given assembly difficult. So what are features of a genome or properties of data that are going to cause problems um, for the genome assembler? So the Assemblathon project was a competition where three different genomes were sequenced, this uh, fish, this parakeet, and the snake that I referred to earlier. And that data was released to the community of people who write assemblers. They assembled the data, submitted it to the organizers, and then the organizers said whose assemblies were good, whose assemblies were bad. And there were a lot of lessons learned from that. Um, but the main one is that the results are, are largely inconsistent between software run on one genome and different genomes run through the same software pro, uh, package. And the reason for that is that there's a lot of factors that go into uh, making a genome assembly. So I've talked a little bit about repeats. So if your genome's highly repetitive, it makes the assembly a lot more difficult. If there's high levels of heterozygosity, so there's a lot of these bubbles in the graph, makes assembly difficult. If you haven't sequenced enough, if the sequencing coverage is biased towards low or high GC regions, that complicates the assembly. Also, there's properties of the data. If the error rate's very high, if you have a lot of chimeric reads, there's sequencing adapters. If there's sample contamination, so you've sequenced two different things by accident instead of just one. Or sometimes when you are sequencing very small organisms, you can't just sequence a single individual to get enough DNA from, but you have to sequence multiple of them. And that then becomes sequencing in an, a population and causes a lot of these bubble-like artifacts in the assembly graph. So what I worked on last year is coming up with ways of measuring these different properties that contribute to difficult or failed assemblies and writing a program that will um, give a report to the users about effectively how difficult their assembly is going to be. And I'm going to walk through this as a more practical part of the talk. So I, sh I, I showed you this picture of structures of the assembly graph earlier. Um, so now we can start labeling different features in the graph. We talked about these tips that are caused by sequencing errors. We talked about bubbles that are caused by heterozygous SNPs and indels. And I talked a little bit about repeats, which cause a lot of branching in the graph. So now uh, the question is going to be whether we can say how often tips occur in the graph, how often SNPs and indels occur, and how repetitive the genome is. Um, so how am I doing on time? 20 minutes left? Okay, great. Um, so the way this works is we, we perform it now. We've built a probabilistic model of the graph using sequencing coverage. So we can annotate every node with however, how many times it's been seen in our data set. So this kamer has been seen 40 times, this one 39, 38, and so on. And when we reach branches in a graph, we can predict whether it's caused by a repeat, whether it's caused by a heterozygous SNP, or whether it's caused by a sequencing error. Uh, and the way that we do that is we, we, we make a model of what the, the the total data histogram will look like. So this is, if we, if we look at every vertex in the graph, what's a histogram of how many times that vertex has been seen? So the mean here is about 30 times. That's a 51 more count here. And it has this nice normal distribution here. So this is a human data set. There's not a lot of heterozygosity. And the data is well covered. We, on average, we see each vertex in the graph about 30 times in our reads. Now, if we compare that to the oyster data, which is one of these organs where we have to sequence multiple individuals, and it's very heterozygous, we see that this 51 mer distribution is bimodal. So there's a population of, of kamers at, a, uh, at about 45x, and there's a second population of kamers at about 22x. So everything that came from this part of the distribution is heterozygous. Everything that came from this part of the distribution is homozygous. And if you compare that to human, there's just a little bump here of the heterozygous kamers, but the oyster data has a huge bump here. 
Now, this is telling us that there's a very high header zygosity within the Oyster data set, and assembling this is going to be really challenging because it, the graph is just going to have these bubbles everywhere that the assembler is going to have to try to resolve. Um, this one? So these are sequencing errors. So these are things seen exactly one time in the data set. Um, there are lots of those. Yeah, you'll always see, see this spike, which roughly has an exponential distribution where copy one is, is fairly frequent, but you, you rarely see a sequencing error twice, three times, and so on. So that's why this falls so sharply. Um, it's assuming that the sequencing errors are random. That's right. Now, ideally, you want um, your distribution to be f quite far out to the right, um, so that you don't you don't want k-mers to be seen zero times because then you have a break in the graph where you just haven't observed a k-mer. The human data set's quite good; it, it's well separated from zero. From zero, this oyster data. Um, is, is slightly too close to zero for comfort. If somebody showed me this and said, what should I do? I'd, I'd tell them they should sequence another, another lane just to push the coverage distribution out to the right a bit more. Okay, so this is the probabilistic model of how um, we, can, we can classify branches in the graph as a, either sequencing errors, heterozygous variation, or repeats. I'm not going to go into the math, um, but I'll just go straight to the results. And if we run it on these six different genomes, the yeast, the fish, the snake, human, bird, and oyster, we start to see stratifications based on how often these heterozygous variation branches occur in the graph. So down here is the yeast data set, and this is a branch rate, uh, 10 to the minus 4 is 1 in 10,000. Because these yeasts are uh, not diploid, we see very rare uh, branches that are due to variation with them. On the other side of the spectrum is the oyster data, where the branches rate is about 1 in 100 bases, and that's consistent with I just showed you where the, the coverage distribution has these two distinct uh, modes, one heterozygous camers, one homozygous camers, and then the other genomes are following within here. So the human genome is here. We have a branch about 1 in 1,000 bases, which is what, roughly what we expect from population genetics. So... This oyster data, extremely hard to assemble. Yeast, very easy to assemble. And, and the other ones falling in between. Now, if we also classify the, the frequency that the, the graph branches due to repeats, we see a similar pattern. Um, now, the human genome is one of the most repetitive. This makes sense because it's the largest genome, and we know that the human genome has tons of transposons, which contribute to assembly difficulty. Again, the oyster genome has... Uh, a high level of repetitiveness, and the yeast genome is not too bad. We should be able to assemble that quite well. So are these plots clear? Do you have any more questions about, about this part before I move on? Okay, so we can also use this statistical model to calculate genome size. Um, so the human genome, as expected, is estimated to be about three gigabases. Uh, the snake is about a gig and a half. The, the cichlid is just below a gigabase, uh, and this parakeet is, is about 1.2. So these pro, this program can be run on just FASTQ data. So you just take your data in FASTQ format, run it on the program, and it will pr produce a PDF of all of these results, predicting how large the genome is, how heterozygous it is, how many repeats, and so on. And that gives you a sense of how difficult your assembly is going to be. The program will also uh, perform QC on your data, so it will plot quality scores as a function of the position in your reads, so you can see whether your data is high or low quality. Um, it will also, it made this error rate plot that we've looked at a couple different times, and it will also try to assess whether there's GC bias. So uh, Illumina sequencing is often amplification based where there's a PCR step, and that PCR step can cause sequences which are either high or low GC to be overrepresented in your data. Um, and this is a good thing to assess prior to your assembly, because if your genome is very GC rich, you want to make sure that it's well covered. Um, so this is a, an example of a good data set 
where we're plotting KMER coverage as a function of GC content, and it's roughly uh, uniform with respect to the GC content. Now, this is a data that's not quite as good, where we see that there's a trend towards lower coverage for higher GC regions. Um, so this might be this might indicate a problem uh, with this data set. Now, again, if we look at the oyster data, we see two distinct distributions here. Again, there's a population of heterozygous camers and homozygous camers here. So the oyster is really the nightmare case for assembly. I use this in all my talks just to indicate just how hard assembly can be. Um, and, and essentially, the, the, the people who published this data weren't able to get a good assembly out of this data. It just didn't assemble at all, and they had to use much longer reads to assemble the oyster genome rather than just 100 base pair lumina data. Okay, and this program will also uh, plot the, the fragment size histogram or the, in the, the paired end fragment sizes for each one of the data sets. So uh, taking snake as an example, the histogram is about uh, a mean of 380 bases, which should match whatever uh, the library prep that, that was performed on this data is. So this is another way that you can see uh, the quality of your data, you can check whether the, the, the empirical fragment size distribution matches what the lab tells you. There are some data sets in here that might be a problem. So, for example, this fish data set, the insert size is less than 200 bases. So since we're sequencing a 100 base read on either end, the um, reads are expected to overlap in the middle by about 20 bases. Uh, that's something the assembler should know as it changes the coverage distribution um, and, and it has to be aware of the fact that the, the, the two compared end reads overlap. Uh, and finally, this program will actually perform a simulated assembly for you so you can predict how well your genome is going to assemble. Um, so as I said here, the yeast data, the contig lengths are much longer. Contig lengths are just on the y-axis here as a function of this Kamer length that I talked about, which is the, the length of the vertices in the brown graph. So the yeast data has, is the easiest to assemble, it has the longest contigs, and as I've said before, the oyster data in yellow here has very short contig, and it's quite hard to assemble, no matter what camer size you use. So this program um, is open source, you can download it and run it on your data, it will give you a PDF report of uh, how difficult your assembly is going to be. Um, it's very useful if, if you're going to ask for help on your assembly, for example, post BioStars or the mailing list of, of the assembly tool that you're trying to use to include this type of report so that the authors of assembly, people like me, can take that report and say, okay, your genome's really heterozygous, you might want to change this parameter up or down and give you tips on how you can parameterize your assembly after taking into account the unique features of your data set. Okay, to end now, I'm just going to talk about long read assembly. So we've had Illumina sequencing for about seven or eight years now, um, and it's been very successful in that we can sequence tons of genomes from all over the tree of life and get a picture of the relationships between species, unique gene contents within different organisms. But the assemblies tend to be very fragmented. As I said before, if you sequence a large eukaryotic genome, the context might only be 10 to 20 kb in length. Now, in contrast, if you take uh, long single molecule sequencing data, like from the Pacific Biosciences sequencer or the, the newest one, the Oxford Nanopore sequencer, the reads might be 10,000 to 20,000 bases themselves, and it makes the assembler's job of resolving these repeats a whole lot easier. Uh, unfortunately, that comes at the cost of a much higher error rate. Within PacBio data, your error rate is around 15 to 20 percent as compared to 1% for Illumina data. But because the reads are so long, the, the read length compensates for that high error rate in, in some ways. You can perform uh, error correction of the long 10 KB reads and then assemble the corrected data, just like I was talking about correcting uh, Illumina reads. Now, for Illumina reads, we had to develop all this machinery for working with the brown graphs. All of that doesn't work when the error rate is that this high, so now we're going back to these overlap-based methods of assembly, which take a whole lot of compute time, but they can de uh, deal with this 15 to 20 percent error rate. So a long read assembly pipeline looks quite similar to a short read assembly pipeline. 
Um, again, we'd perform read trimming and read filtering, then perform some error correction, construct a graph, clean the graph, build contigs, and then we've added this polishing step. Now, I'll talk about the two unique features uh, of long read pipelines in turn. So typically, error correction is now overlap based rather than based on KMERS. And because of finding overlaps between high error rate, long reads is very expensive. This can take thousands of compute hours. And now there's this trend where for short read assemblers, we were only worried about memory efficiency. We wanted to perform the assembly using as little memory as possible. Now we have to worry about compute time for long read assembly. Memory is no longer a concern. We're just concerned about how long it takes for the assembly to complete because we've gone back to these overlap based techniques. Um, and this final step, which we call consensus polishing, is where we're trying to um, compute the final sequence of the genome using a probabilistic model of the sequencer. So the idea here is that if we take our, our, our raw packed bio reads, which have 15% error rate, and then construct contigs from them using overlap-based techniques, the final assembly might have an error every one in 100 bases. And that's not good enough if you want to, say, find genes from that assembly or perform any sort of population analysis. So people have been developing models of, uh, of the sequencing data where we can run a hidden Markov model taking all of the, da the data into account and compute a new consensus sequence, which is more like 1 in 10,000 error rate rather than 1 in 100. So these two are steps, error correction of long, noisy reads, and consensus polishing of long noisy reads are really the, the fundamental difficulty of working with long read data and, and the problems that people who, who write sequence analysis algorithms are dealing with now. Um, so I've just put three different papers up here if you want to read more about long read assembly. So this is the classic paper where uh, Jason Chin and um, his colleagues at PacBio showed that by using PacBio data, you can assemble bacterial genomes into a single contig, so the genome's not fragmented at all. Essentially, you've taken your genome, sequenced it, and then put it back together perfectly. Um, now, this is extremely computationally expensive, and, and, and some colleagues of mine, Adam Philippi and uh, Sergey Korin, are trying to tr apply these long... Uh, read assembly approaches to very large genomes, so they now have a pipeline that's efficient enough to assemble the human genome using PAC bio data. And um, this paper here is, is a paper from my lab where we've uh, collaborated with Nick Lohman in the UK to assemble bacterial genomes into one contig using Oxford Nanopore data. And, and for those of you who aren't aware, Oxford Nanopore is a sequencing instr instrument that's roughly the size of a smartphone. You can fit it in your pocket. It's extremely portable. Our, our colleague Josh Quick is right now uh, in West Africa sequencing Ebola samples right in, in, in clinical labs uh, to wait in, as a way of tracking the, the outbreak and population uh, genetics of Ebola. And really, this, it's an incredibly exciting technology in that now we can move sequencing anywhere and, and, and sort of rapidly sequence outbreaks. Do you have a question? So um, it's improving all the time. Initially, it was almost 30 to 40 percent, which is incredibly difficult to work with. Now it's about, it's comparable to PacBio, where it's about 20 percent, 15 percent at best. So what, 